Ah, there we go. All right. You guys want to see a little magic to start off with? That did not sound very enthusiastic at all. You guys want to see a little magic to start? All right, there we go. See, now you guys, you, got, you have to be like the little engine that could. You just have to make a lot of noise, sound like a big crowd. Um, most of you have seen a magician produce a live animal before, usually a dove or a rabbit. And there's two reasons for this. One, doves and rabbits don't bite you. The other reason is you can cram them into an incredibly small space and they won't struggle or make any noise while you shove the little butts in there. And to demonstrate, I'm gonna produce a live dove from a deck of cards and an empty scarf with no sleeves. And when you see this dove, I expect some applause out of you because I gave up a lot of my social life for this crap, all right? All right, so here we go, empty scarf, deck of cards, little uh, laptop drum roll from the audience. Huh? There we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's just... It's just a lot easier that way, isn't it? it isn't it? Laughter changes your brain, you know that? It actually changes the chemistry in your brain. When uh, my darkest tragic moments in my life, my friends get me to laugh, and it changes everything. There's a, a story I like to tell to start our show off with, and this is Honest God True Stories. About four years ago, uh, my wife got a text message, and this story just shows how laughter changes your moment. Uh, my wife got a text message from a 17-year-old girl. She said, I'm standing on the bridge. I love you guys. You'll get along fine without me. Goodbye. My wife's known her since she was seven, and we lived in Rockland at the time, which is 15 minutes from the Forest Hill Bridge, which is the third most frequented suicide bridge in the country. That's 15 minutes, and we get this text message. My wife says, you talk to her. I don't know what to say to her. And she goes, you struggle. You talk to her. And so I get her on the phone. I go, I know you want. You don't want to die. You want this pain to stop. I go, where are you at right now? She said, I parked my car, and I'm standing on the middle of the bridge. And I said, what bridge are you at? And she said, Fair Oaks. I said, uh, <laughs> what avenue, Fair Oaks? She goes, yeah. I go, that's a crappy bridge to jump off of. <laughs> it's like 40 feet high. You're going to sprain your ankle. And she starts laughing. And she goes, well, there's hypothermia. I go, no, it's not that cold. <laughs> this is California. It's uncomfortable. And she starts laughing more. I go, why don't you come and hang out with us? We're doing karaoke at the winery. And she goes, okay, fine. I go, what are you doing? She goes, I'm walking back to my car. I'll see you in 20 minutes. And she came to our house. Yeah, thank you for that. It changed. As soon as I heard her laugh, I knew everything was going to be fine. So let's give a huge round of applause from Sacramento, California, the lovely and talented Miss Sydney Steigerts. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. How are we? Good, depressed, awesome, perfect. Uh, I'm what you guys call 100 footer, uh, which basically just means you can tell how gay I am from 100 feet away. Thank you, or however far back that is. Thank you so much. <laughs> I am gay, and it's kind of cool. I do enjoy it, and I'm very lucky that I have such supportive parents, right? My mom is great. Me and my mom are very close. We actually have a lot in common. We both haven't been with a man in 27 years. <laughs> uh, no, I am very lucky, though, that my parents are very supportive, right? I'm very lucky. The problem is they're almost too supportive. They're like, Sydney, we've known you were gay since you were two years old. Girl, <laughs> what gay stuff was I doing? <laughs> At two years old, right? But that's when I realized, guys, if you don't have a gay cousin, you're probably the gay cousin. What's up, you guys? How you doing, huh? Yes, come on! Come on! What's wrong with this side of the room? Um, <laughs> literally no one. Uh, it's an odd, oh, just kidding. Hi, ma'am. Uh, I'm old, I'm a 42, and I got married, bless you. Uh, <laughs> he's like, ugh, ugh, ugh. Uh, I'm 42, you guys. So at 42, you think that you're done, you know what I mean? Like, you think that you're just gonna be the funny best friend, the drunk fifth wheel forever, and you're okay with that. And the, as soon as I said that to the universe, like, I'm good, it's okay, I'm gonna be single for life. Right, that's when the universe threw this fat man into my life and was like, yo, that's your forever. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> game on. <laughs> it's weird being married at 42, you guys. It's weird, I thought I was done, you know? Because uh, I don't feel like an adult. That's the thing. Make some noise if you don't feel like an adult, okay? Like, right. 
I feel like there's some things that I don't know that I feel like adults know, you know? Like, I don't know what tomato paste is, and I don't know why you would use it, you know? And my husband still uses an Xbox controller as a remote control, so we're the same kind of trash. That's, uh, that's basically what I'm saying. All right, so those are my friends, uh, some new friends, old friends. Um, so here's how we got started doing this. Um, six years ago, September 20th, I had a 5150. And uh, if you don't know what a 5150 is, it's a... Uh, an album that Van Halen put out in 1986, um, or it's a 72-hour hold in a mental hospital for being suicidal. And I was 54 years old. Um, I had never talked about my depression ever before that. And a couple months later, I found a suicide note I wrote in the sixth grade. And I thought, first I thought, oh, sixth grade, that's so cute. And then I thought, so since at least the sixth grade, my whole life, I've had suicidal ideation and thought of suicide my entire life, and I'd never talked about it. And then I watched the Robin Williams special, Come Inside My Mind, this two-hour-long documentary about his life, and they don't even mention the word depression. Not a word. And I thought, you know, I bet I could get some comedians to talk about it. And so we started having meetings and talk about how would a show look. We'll talk about anything. Comics have no boundaries. There's not a topic you can think of that we haven't talked about. And so I, I wanted a structure and a format. So I interviewed doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists. I go, what would you want to see talked about? If you went to an event and you had four people on stage who will talk about anything, what are the things you'd want to see talked about? And from all those interviews, we came up with five questions. When we're done, we want all of you to have a copy of these five questions. There's a table out front, our one degree table, and there's little business cards that have the five questions. And those questions come from all those interviews. And so uh, this next part of the show is, um, we want to show you what it looks like to have a conversation. This is a training program on how to talk about depression. So the first question is that, what does it feel like physically? Um, I'll do this one first. So for me, um, it, I can usually feel it coming on like a cold. You know how you, you feel like a cold's coming on and you're gonna wake up tomorrow and you're gonna be sick? And there's times when I'll tell my wife tomorrow's gonna be hard, I can feel it. Um, um, it I, I physically feel it in my chest, almost like an indigestion, almost like a heartburn. And my chest feels tight. Um, my breathing feels more shallow um, when my depression's coming on. Um, my, the mornings are worse for me. Um, I usually, I wake up with some level of depression every morning. Um, it's, it's rare. When I travel, I don't as much if I'm on the road, but it's, it's rare that I don't wake up and just have that sinking feeling, um, and it hurts. It physically hurts from my throat uh, down to my, my whole chest hurts, and, and it's exhausting. So uh, physically, that's what I get. Carlos, what about you? Physically, what do you get with your depression? Uh, I don't have depression. I lied about it just so I can get on this show. <laughs> I need the Comics pay. Comics yeah, will right. do anything for a gig. Yeah. I need the money. <laughs> Comedy at 1 p.m. is really killer in yeah. Sacramento. Yeah. <laughs> it's anything will do. <laughs> no, uh, my depression, the physical, the way that physically it feels, it, yeah, it feels like a like like heat stroke. Like when you get the heat, I don't know if you've had a heat stroke and 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 drinking through a heat stroke too. If you ever rip, uh, go down the raft, river rafting and stuff like that, and that's what it just like, you know, I'm feel I'm here, but I'm not here. And then all I want to do is go to sleep, and I don't want to wake up. And when I do wake up, I just try to go right back to sleep. It doesn't even matter how much I've slept, um, and it's uh, it's tiring, and it's also lonely. It's very lonely. Yeah. So that's that's what my mind feels like. All right, so that's our first question. What does it feel like physically? The second question is, what do um, others do that makes it worse? Uh, Sydney, you do this one first. What do others do that makes it worse if you're having depression? Um, it's definitely, like, changed over the years, obviously. Uh, when I was younger and, you know, getting kicked off the basketball team and things like that, obviously, uh, I already hated myself so much for being gay. And I'm like, joke's on you. You can't hate me more than I hate me, right? Um... And, like, growing up, obviously parents mean well, my parents mean well, but sometimes uh, they say really not nice things, and that kind of have stuck with me as an adult that I just kind of play on repeat, and whether it's, like, about how I look or what I'm doing and just that kind of stuff. Um, but also I really don't like when people make my feelings about them and it's like when I'm already in this hole of like, oh, I just shouldn't exist, I shouldn't be here, and people are like, well, why aren't you responding to me? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? And I'm like, well, I'm trying not to off myself right now, right? right? They make it about them, or it's just like, 
uh, if I feel like I have to act a certain way. Like, people put expectations on me on how I should act, especially as a comic. It's like, oh, you're supposed to be happy and bubbly and smiley all the time. You have to be the funny one at every event. Right, right. Next question is, what do others do that makes it better? What do others do that help you um, with your depression? For me, what others do that help is it, it's, it's having that, that small core group of really close friends mm -hmm. that know you so well, that know that you, when your dog dies, they can joke with you, mm -hmm. right? And having those, those you got to have, you need a, a few of those friends because people are busy and they don't always text you back right away if you're, if you're standing on the bridge. So you need more than one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that's, that's the same thing that Chelsea said. It's having that a, a one or two people that you know you can share everything with. Um, that's, that really is helpful. My wife and I have, um, to have my wife be that person that we can share, she can see it. Um, a friend of mine who's a doctor, he said, it's interesting. He goes, if I ask someone, do you struggle with depression? They'll lie. They'll say, no, I'm, or if I ask them, how are you? They'll say, fine, they'll lie. But if, if I ask them specific questions, then he goes, I'll get specific answers. Yeah. Yeah. Chelsea, what about you? What do you do that makes it worse? What do you do? To, to give you guys a better um, kind of understanding of where like my later depression came from, um, my son was uh, nine months old and I was engaged to be married and that's when he first put his hands on me. So, um, so I'm actually a survivor of domestic violence and really bad domestic violence. Um, uh, like police reports, bruises. Um, I had to document a lot of stuff. I was choked. I was thrown into a tool shed. I was locked out of the house, kept away from my son. So, and this was all before he was one. Uh, so that later on depression, you know, cause I had the early stuff, you know, like you're fat, you're not popular, you're not funny. Like I had all of that, you know, the everyday depression that you get two scoops of, you know, like I had that. But this later on depression came on. And for me to experience that and then blame myself for putting myself in that position. Mm. So not only am I hearing from this, I'm not allowed to say it, but it's a clean show. Uh, but I'm not uh, to hear the things that he would say to me because he would say incredibly just dangerous, harmful, hurtful, hatred things to me, right? Uh, and, I, and I heard them, and they sank in, because when you hear someone say it that many times, it's real. But not only that, I'm hearing it from him, but then I'm also giving it to myself, because, yo, you got yourself in this. You chose that, dude. So I'm listening to those things and they're coming at me from two different sides that are both inside me and it's insanely overwhelming. So the listening to your voices, I do that on a, all the time, all the time. If it sinks in, all those things come back. They'll never go away, but you learn how to overcome and you learn how to become stronger than those voices because I know that that was coming from such a toxic, poison human being, and he was just doing it to create power over me, which he did for a second, and I'm stronger than I've ever been in my life now, and I'm so grateful. So uh, listening to those voices uh, is detrimental, but once you learn how to become stronger and stand up and tell those voices that they have no power, you're unstoppable. So, and as Carlos, what do you do that makes it better? What do I do? Last that helps question: me? What do you do that helps you the most with your depression? I got a dog. I got a new dog. Um, because like, because I didn't want to like, like I used to want to kill myself a lot, like what you call it. And then, you know, I was I told Brown one time too. I was like, I go, um, but my dog keeps me alive. And then he was talking about it too. We were like, yeah, because like the dog doesn't know why you're gone. You know, and and then I didn't have anybody at the time. I have a girlfriend now who has a daughter, and it's like I can't really be taken off like that, you know? And so I, she actually- but We but, talked about this once, because my, my wife had asked mm. me once, why, how does your dog keep you alive when not your kids, not your, mm. and, and we, we uh, Carlos and I, I go, because the dog wouldn't understand. Yeah, the dog wouldn't Like understand. if I died by suicide, it would be tragic, but you would, under, you would know what happened and the dog wouldn't know, and I can't do that. Yeah, so right? that's what Which I Which is a weird, interesting, though. it's that's a weird, like, yeah. but it's, yeah. there's. But it makes sense. Yeah, and so I do that, and then oh, uh, uh, I go see movies. I'm, I'm a big, I love going to movie theaters because I get to shut off the world. I turn off my phone, I get to be entertained, and it's just, 
it's, it's dark and it's just comforting and then I can eat and no one's watching me and I can just, I can just pig out. Um, for me, this show definitely, um, comedy, um, yeah, this show's the first time I've ever wanted to live. Um, from doing this, that I've wanted to live more than I wanted. I've spent most of my life just wanting to not make it through the next day or tomorrow or, um, and this gives me purpose and a reason and it's just shown me how sharing our stories and talking about it is the biggest thing, talking about it. You know, there's so many steps to dealing with depression and we're not up here because we have answers. We're just up here because we'll talk about it and we wanna show you what it looks like to talk about it. We don't give advice because we don't have it figured out. You know, we're still, you can see some of us are way more screwed up than others. I'm not going to say any names or point, <laughs> but we're all in different places and that's why, but we're all talking about it. And that's what this show's about is we give you these five questions as tools for you to have a conversation, um, either with yourself, journal them for yourself, or to have this conversation with someone else. The show's called One Degree of Separation, a funny look at depression and suicide. And the one degree is if you don't struggle with depression, you know somebody who does. We are all connected to this, even more so after COVID. And I think the one good thing out of COVID is that people are much more willing now to talk about it. And, uh, and this is our show. And this is what we do. Once again, let's give a big round of applause for my comedian friends. And thank you, Taylor and Victoria, for putting this. Give them a huge round of applause for putting this together and making this happen. Um, and yourselves, a huge round of applause for coming out here and seeing what we're all about. Thank you, guys. Thank you thank so much. Thank you so much.